Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to the very last Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium talk of 2022. My name is Tolbu Glatz, and I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Public Health here at Charité. Before I get to our speaker of today, I also wanted to introduce the amazing team behind BEMB, consisting of Shisato Ito and Megan Forrest, who are with us on the panel here today, and also Tobias Kurt and Jess Roman, who couldn't join us this time around. Now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Annika Hoyer. She has studied mathematics and biostatistics in Halle and Munich and did a PhD in Düsseldorf while working at the German Diabetes Center. And then afterwards, she held a professorship in biostatistics at the Department of Statistics at the LMU in Munich. And since September 2021, she's a professor for biostats and medical biometry at Bielefeld University. She will talk to us about meta-analysis of diagnostic test accuracy studies. And if during the talk you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A, which should be a bottom at the, a bot a bottom at the bottom of your screen. And um, if you want, we can also unmute you later so that you can ask your own question after the talk. And with all of these things out of the way, I hand it over to you, Annika. So hi, everybody, and, and also a warm welcome from my side. First of all, um, thanks for the introduction and also for inviting me to give a talk today um, and to present to you some of my research works. So in the next round about 50 minutes, I would talk about um, some statistical approaches for the special kind of the meta analysis of diagnostic test accuracy studies, but no worries. I don't want to primarily focus on, on complicated equations and complicated statistical models. I will put a focus on um, the practical applications and to, to show you how the models work and how their results are interpreted. So I would be rather happy if you take away after the talk that um, the situation of the meta-analysis of diagnostic test accuracy studies require some advanced statistical techniques and you know what kind of model can be used in which situation and you are aware how the models can be interpreted. Um, this would be the main goal for today's talk. Um, first, sorry, first um, I would like to start with a short motivation and introduction in the general topic of diagnostic test accuracy study. So I would like to remind you what is the diagnostic test accuracy study? Why is such a ki such kind of study important in clinical research? And um, what is the data behind such a study? Um, then I would like to move on to the meta-analysis part. And first I um, want to present to you um, the, the most simple um, case of a meta-analysis where we have one diagnostic test reporting on one pair of sensitivity and specificity that should be pooled or summarized in a meta-analytic way. Then we move forward to the more complicated way where we are interested in the meta-analysis of a full RC curves, um, where RC curves means receiver operating characteristic curves. In this case, um, we have several diagnostic studies evaluating the same diagnostic test, but reporting full RC curves, meaning several pairs of sensitivity and specificity each one corresponding to a different diagnostic threshold. And finally, I would like to give you something like a short outlook, what can be done next and how um, are our methods related to epidemiological questions. So I would like to, to especially point out how our results can be applied in the context um, for evaluating screening programs. But now I think we, we um, should start with a, a short introduction, a short motivation of the whole topic. Um, as you might have heard in the introduction, I worked for several years at the German Diabetes Center in Düsseldorf. So many um, of our projects are motivated by questions related to diabetes. Um, this would be also the case in the talk for today. So Many examples I would like to show you are based on type 2 diabetes. And so let's start with the example type 2 diabetes. Um, the prevalence of diagnosed type 2 diabetes in Germany is currently about 8%. 
That means 8% of the whole German population has a, a type 2 diabetes diagnosis. And uh, the, this kind of population know that they have diabetes. And so they are treated. They get a treatment um, and are treated by a physician. If you have the diagnosis type 2 diabetes, this comes along with an increased mortality compared to people without diabetes and also with an increased risk for late complications such as um, kidney diseases or nephropathy, something like this. So um, you have an increased risk for, for diabetes-related uh, late complications. On the other hand, the prevalence of undiagnosed type 2 diabetes in Germany is about 2%. And that means 2% of the German population suffer from type 2 diabetes, but they are not aware of it. So they didn't get already um, a diagnosis of their disease. But also this kind of people suffer from an increased mortality compared to people without diabetes, and also from an increased risk for, late for associated late complications. Um, but, and this is important, the people with undiagnosed type 2 diabetes um, have no chance for treatment uh, due to the missing diagnosis. So it's a bit unfair um, compared to people with, di with diagnosed type 2 diabetes because of the missing treatment. And at this place, um, diagnostic tests play an important role. So um, currently, it is a case that much efforts are spent in developing new diagnostic tests to enable um, an early diagnosis on, and especially to enable the appropriate treatment of a disease, for example, type 2 diabetes. Um, and thereby, we have to, to differ between two special kinds of diagnostic tests. So we have um, the so-called screening tests that enable the earliest possible diagnosis. Um, for this kind of test, we are interested in a very high sensitivity, or on the other hand, we have our confirmation tests um, that are used to confirm a suspected disease. And for such kinds of diagnostic tests, um, we are interested in high specificities. But both of them, the screening tests as well as the confirmation tests, provide the basis for an efficient treatment. So diagnostic tests are the first step to diagnose a disease and therefore the first step to enable um, an appropriate treatment of a disease. Um, and that means before anyone can get a treatment, um, uh, um, a drug or something else, you have to apply a diagnostic test um, to ensure that the people who, who are tested um, definitely suffer from the disease. So this is something like the first step um, uh, in, in treatment of people. From a statistical point of view, um, we, are, we have two main questions that should be answered based on the data available. So the first one is that we aim to determine a suitable diagnostic test. Um, as I said before, currently there, there are much efforts um, spent in developing new tests. And from a statistical point of view, we, we get the we um, uh, um, help to, to, to make the right decision which test should be used in practice. So there are several tests, for example, for diagnosing type 2 diabetes. And with statistical knowledge, we uh, can decide which test should be applied in practice. And the second question that should be asked is, um, what is the optimal diagnostic threshold that should be used in practice? Uh, with optimal diagnostic threshold, um, it, is mean, it is meant that a physician should know when um, a person is tested positive or when it is tested negative. Let's consider, uh, again, the example of type 2 diabetes. Um, one of the most applied diagnostic tests um, for type 2 diabetes is the measurement of HbA1c. HbA1c is, is a blood marker measured in percent, and uh, the currently used diagnostic threshold is 6.5%. So if somebody um, went to a doctor and um, the HbA1c test is performed and the person gets an HbA1c value of about 6.7, then the doctor knows 6.7 is greater than 6.5, so the person is classified as someone 
with type 2 diabetes. Um, and uh, the determination of such thresholds is a statistical question because um, every threshold is, is possible, but we should define some criteria that can be used to define what is meant with optimal diagnostic threshold. And such, such a decision can be based on an ROC curve and also on a meta analysis of an ROC curve that um, I will present to you later in this talk. So these are the two main questions that we want to answer from a statistical point of view concerning diagnostic tests. Um, the, the data behind a diagnostic test accuracy study is somewhat simple, I think, because everything can be presented in a contingency table as shown here. You have the new diagnostic test, the test under um, evaluation, which can be positive or negative with respect to the, so the chosen threshold. And then you have the so-called gold standard test. The gold standard test is a test that is already applied in practice and where um, everybody relies on. So the gold standard test is used in a diagnostic study to classify if someone is diseased or if someone is not non-diseased. That means by the gold standard, you know the true disease status of your study participants. And then they underwent the new diagnostic test, which can be positive or negative, leading to different results that can be depicted in the contingency table. So if the new test is positive and someone is um, diseased by gold standard um, classification, then we have our TP or true positive test result, or the new test is negative and the person is um, non-diseased, then we have our TN, our true negative test results. And the new test works um, perfectly fine if we only have true positive classifications and true negative classifications. But in practice, uh, this is um, not always the case. So we already have some misspecifications and then um, the new test is positive, but the person you have tested is um, non-disease, then we have our FP, our false positive um, test result, or the new test is negative, but the person is diseased, then we have some false negative classifications. And um, this result depicted here in the contingency table should be taken into account when we aim for evaluating the new test. And to evaluate finally our test, we have two measures that are of interest. And the first one, is the so-called sensitivity, which is a conditional probability that the new test is positive if someone is truly diseased. And this can be simply calculated from the contingency table. The second uh, probability of interest, interest is the specificity, meaning the conditional probability that the new test is negative in case someone is non-diseased. And also the specificity can be calculated um, simply from the contingency table. So um, after these two probabilities are calculated, then we can decide whether our test, our new test is appropriate for the practice or not. And as said before, if we aim for a screening test, then we would like to have higher sensitivities. And if we like to have a confirmation test, then we, um, are preferring higher specificities. So um, the weighting of both measures depends on the situation um, we want to evaluate. Let's move to, to a short example. Um, also from diabetes research, our new test that should be evaluated is the HbA1c test I already talked about. And the gold standard test is the OGTT, which is the oral glucose tolerance test. Um, the oral glucose tolerance test um, was long the, the standard method for diagnosing type 2 diabetes, but it comes along with some difficulties for, for the people who are um, undergoing this test because they, they have to, to fast. Um, and the, the test overall uh, requires long waiting and so on. So um, for practical applications, um, the, the HbA1c test would be better. So there are many studies that aim to evaluate the HbA1c test in comparison to the OGTT. And here I have um, some data from a real study where we have 65 true positive results, uh, 1,602 true negative results, um, 82 
false positive and 50 false negative results. And from this contingency table, we can simply calculate sensitivity and specificity. And we get a sensitivity of around about 56% and a specificity of 95%. Um, and this example shows you that as a result from this study, the specificity of the HbA1c test is rather good with about 95%, but sensitivity is not that good as, as expected. So it's questionable if, if uh, the HbA1c test is an appropriate screening test, for example. But the main takeaway message from this um, slide would be, if you have the contingency table available, um, the calculation of the measures of interest, sensitivity, and specificity is rather simple, or can be rather simple done. Um, in practice, it is, it is often the case that we not have only one study available, but several studies that evaluate, evaluate the same diagnostic test. So we have not only one study that is interested in evaluating the HbA1c test, but several around, about, around over the world. And if this is the case, we are interested in synthesizing the results in a so-called meta-analysis. Um, meta-analysis is currently a, a well-defined um, method uh, that is often done in practice, especially uh, when we're talking about clinical trials. So methods for the meta-analysis of clinical trials or intervention trials are well established today and routinely used in practice. Um, but it's, it's somewhat more complicated if we talk about diagnostic tests. And um, in a few minutes, I will, will show you why this is the case. So let's first think about what is a meta-analysis in general. general. Um, as I said before, it's, it's a kind of data synthesis. We have several studies with the same diagnostic test that should be summarized. Um, it is a quantitative systematic summary of several studies with the aim of gaining new information. So we have different studies, same diagnostic tests, but the studies have different sample sizes, for example. And now we want to create a summary measure that accounts for different um, sample sizes um, for, for other things that are different between the study and so on. And finally, we want to get as a meta-analytic sensitivity and a meta-analytic specificity in case of diagnostic accuracy studies. And if you think about clinical study studies, we are interested, for example, in a summary odds ratio or summary relative risk. Um, until now, and also in the future, there's an increasing interest in meta-analysis and systematic reviews, which are the basis for meta-analysis, because um, meta-analysis are um, the, the, the highest level of evidence-based medicine, and so there's an increasing interest um, in systematic reviews as well as in appropriate statistical methods to, to perform such a kind um, of meta-analysis. Um, if you think about diagnostic tests, we have the situation shown here in this slide. We have our different studies. Here we have two example studies, study one, study two, and then we will have study three, four, five, six, and so on. And each study report a pair of sensitivity and specificity. Um, the aim of the meta-analysis is then to, to pool sensitivity and specificity. Um, again, accounting for the different sample sizes, and um, to have finally our meta-analytic sensitivities and specificities. Um, compared to intervention studies, this is uh, somewhat complicated because in intervention studies, you have only one primary outcome. You have one odds ratio per study that should be pooled. In diagnostic tests uh, or diagnostic accuracy studies, we have two outcomes two co-primary outcomes of sensitivity and specificity. So we, we aim to pull both, both of them. And that means we have at least a so-called bivariate two-dimensional model that should be used. And, um, and, and another important point is that in a meta-analysis, sensitivity and specificity are generally negatively correlated. And that means we need um, um, a multivariate, a bivariate model that is able to account for our co-primary endpoint and also for the fact 
that sensitivity and specificity are negative correlated. And that means um, we have some, some advanced statistical techniques behind this kind of meta analysis. Um, Good news are that there are there exist already several approaches for the meta analysis of diagnostic test accuracy studies, um, and the the standardly used approaches start with the same assumption. We assume that the numbers of true positives and true negatives are binomially distributed, with the sensitivity and specificity as success probabilities. This is. The, the, the main assumption in um, most of the models. The model that is then used and also recommended by Cochrane is to apply a generalized linear mixed model. That means we log it transform our sensitivity and specificity, which are then normally distributed, um, leading to a logistically normally distributed numbers of true positives and true negatives per study. And then, as I said before, we have to count that both of them are correlated, and this is done using a random, random effect. So we have a bivariate a generalized linear mixed model with a bivariate um, random effect that is used to account for the correlation. This is normally or often done um, if you are interested in summarizing the results of several diagnostic studies. Um, this model unfortunately comes along with some disadvantages. Um, it is a general disadvantage of generalized linear mixed models that they have sometimes numerical problems. So it can be the case that you want to apply the model, but it doesn't work. So you get, get no results because of non-convergence and so on. Um, Due to this fact, we have to have uh, developed alternative models, but we start with the same point. So we assume that the numbers of true positives and true negatives are binomially distributed, and then we apply the concept of so-called copulas. Um, copulas are um, a class of statistical models, are a class of distributions that enables us to, to simply construct higher dimensional distributions. So we have our starting point, the binomial distributions of the true positives and true negatives, and then we assume that the sensitivities and specificities are better distributed. Um, we avoid to, to transfer them to, um, via a logit transformation, and we always work on the original case, so the better distribution is a distribution working between or living between zero and one. So we are on the original scale of our sensitivities and specificities. Um, that leads to the fact that our true positives and true negatives are better binomial distributed. And then we use our copula to model the correlation between sensitivity and specificity. This model has some advantages compared to the generalized linear mixed model because um, we have a closed form likelihood. That means we know that our true positives and true negatives um, are better binomially distributed. And we can simply construct the corresponding likelihood function, maximize them, and then we have our maximum likelihood estimates, um, which works quite more stable from a numerical point of view. Um, for this, I would like to, to give you a really short overview of what is meant by such a copula, because the copula can be applied um, in, a, in a wide range. So it's, it's not limited to applications in, on, in diagnostic tests or applications in econometrics. It can be applied in um, nearly every field in epidemiology. So what, uh, what does a cop copula do? We have our basic distribution assumptions, our starting point that the true positives and true negatives are binomially distributed with sensitivity and specificity as um, success probabilities. Um, we assume that sensitivity and specificity are better distributed um, and aim to estimate the um, values, the parameters of the beta, distrib beta distribution. This leads to the fact that our true positives and true negatives, um, as said before, are better binomially distributed. And now we apply the con concept of copulas. Um, a copula is 
nothing more than a multivariate cumulative distribution function constructed depending on univariate marginal distributions. Or in short, we assume we have two better distributions, um, choose a copula and the copula combines the two better distribution and makes one of them. Um, so our idea was to, to use our better binomial distributions of the true positives and true negatives as marginal distribution and construct our bivariate joint distribution via a copula. Um, and the, the main theorem that is then applied is so-called SCLAS theorem, and um, this states that we can construct our bivariate, our joint distribution based on our copula C and based on our better binomial marginal distributions. These functions are known because we know um, how a better binomial distribution looks out. And the copula C is also given. It can be chosen from a bunch of possibilities. Um, then we aim for a maximum likelihood estimation. So we construct our likelihood as a product of likelihoods of the copula and the marginal distributions. Um, and that means we have finally a rather stable um, statistical model that can be applied for the simple situation where we have the meter analysis of one diagnostic test reporting on one pair of sensitivity and specificity per study. Um, to show you how this works in practice, I have um, brought an example, which is often used to illustrate um, models for the meta analysis of diagnostic test accuracy studies. This example focuses on telomerase um, as a tumor maker for bladder cancer. Um, and it is based on 10 studies that are included in a systematic review. And for illustration, we use all three, we use both methods. We have First, the generalized linear mixed model, which is routinely used in practice. And this model leads to a sensitivity of about 77% and a specificity of about 90%, with a corresponding 95% um, confidence interval. And then we have our copula approach, first based on the so-called Gaussian copula, which is something like a, a two-dimensional normal distribution. And um, this copula leads to a sensitivity of about 79% and a specificity of about 82%. Um, and then we also apply the so-called placket copula to, to check if there are difference between um, various copulas. And we see that we have a sensitivity of about 78% and a specificity of about 87%. So you see that all three methods um, method leads to, lead to uh, results in terms of sensitivity and specificity. We have slight differences. So the specificity of the generalized linear mixed model is, is highest compared to the copula approach. But in terms of sensitivity, we have um, rather near or rather comparable results between the different approaches. This um, Example data set is of special interest due to another fact. In this example data set, we have strong negative correlations between sensitivity and specificity. And this is why the generalized linear mixed model is often criticized, because we have um, estimates for sensitivity and specificity. But if we are interested in estimating the correlation between them, then we get, we get no result um, for the generalized linear mixed model. So it cannot cope with um, negative correlations that are too, um, too high or too strong. And this is not the case for the Gaussian or Plackett copula approach. So there we get some results for the negative correlations. And, and that means the copula model works um, more stable compared to the mixed model approach. And this is something that we have confirmed in a simulation study. So we performed a huge simulation study comparing our different approaches. And it turns out that uh, in, in, in terms of bias or coverage or the mean scared error, the copula model is comparable and sometimes favorable compared to the generalized linear mix model, but especially with respect to, to numerical robustness and convergence, there we have seen that the copula model is um, more stable compared to a mixed model. So I would like to say that 
um, it can be the case if you want to perform a meter analysis of diagnostic tests um, that you observe some convergence issues uh, with respect to the application of mixed models, and then the copula approach can be a valid alternative um, to get uh, the, the results um, you aim for. And then this model can be extended in various ways. We uh, did it um, also already. We um, uh, developed a model that can account for the disease prevalence as a third random variable. This can be the case if you aim to, um, to summarize uh, diagnostic test accuracy studies in, in cohort design, then um, the prevalence plays a role. Um, and you can use a model developed by us that accounts for the prevalence. This leads to, to one more dimension in the trivariate model. And another thing that is already done, we um, extended the model to, to compare two diagnostic tests. This is also often the case. You have um, two or more tests that can be used to, um, uh, to, to determine if someone has type 2 diabetes. And then both tests are, um, every, every, pay, every person underwent both tests in a diagnostic study. And then we have one contingency table for the HB. A1C test, for example, and another contingency table for, for a second test, which can be, for example, fasting plasma glucose. And then we have um, a so-called extended diagnostic uh, contingency table. Um, and then we, we can also um, extend our approach, uh, from the Coppola approach, to four dimension dimensions, which enables us to compare two tests that are applied to the same persons, which is, as I said before, um, already done in practice. Um, this for, for the simple case um, where we have our uh, one diagnostic test and, and one diagnostic threshold, one pair of sensitivity and specificity. But in practice, the situation is quite more complicated. In practice, we are co um, confronted with the meta analysis of our C curves. And then the situation looks as follows. We have, again, our situation, we have several um, studies evaluating the same diagnostic tests. Um, in this example, um, again, the HbA1c test to determine whether someone has type 2 diabetes. And um, the situation is a bit more complicated because every study reports on different diagnostic thresholds. So in practice, it is often the case that a single study um, does not focus only on one diagnostic threshold and report the corresponding sensitivity and specificity. Often several um, diagnostic thresholds are evaluated. And this is the um, information um, we get from a statistical point of view or from a, or a, or a database. We have our studies, study one reporting on three different thresholds ranging from 5.3 to 5.6, and to each of the thresholds correspond a sensitivity and a specificity. In the, in the single studies, then the our C curve would be plotted, and then um, there would be made as a decision which diagnostic threshold should be used in practice. Um, if if we plan to do um, a conventional Meta analysis, then one possible way would to select one threshold and to select one pair of sensitivity and specificity and use the statistical techni techniques I presented to you. But uh, this would not be the best way because then we waste many of the observations. And this is a challenge um, we, we have dealt in some of our projects. Um, we have the challenge that the RC curves from that our C curves from the single studies are provided with different pairs of sensitivities and specificities at multiple diagnostic thresholds. And we do not want to waste um, observations, so we do not want to select um, a specific diagnostic threshold. The additional challenge is then that also the values and the number of the thresholds may vary between the studies. So um, you can see it here again. Uh, the first study have threshold 5.3, 5.5, and 5.6, but study two used 5.8, 5.9, and so on. So um, 
these thresholds per, um, in the first study with these values and two thresholds in the second study, study with, an, um, with other thresholds. And this information should also be incorpor incorporated in the corresponding statistical model. Um, for this kind of data set, we have developed a new approach, and this new approach is motivated from survival analysis. So we transferred methods that are applicable um, in context of survival models to the situation of the meta-analysis of diagnostic test accuracy studies. And finally, we um, developed a model based on bivariate time to event um, distributions and we used also so-called interwar sensor data. In this model, I would like to present to you in short, and also I would like to focus on uh, the general idea behind the model. Um, for this, I've selected one specific study, and this specific study um, yeah, have shown the, the ROC curve shown here. So we have on the x-axis plotted one minus specificity and on the y-axis sensitivity. And the study I've chosen here, also with respect to the HBA, to the evaluation of HbA1c, has originally reported on three different thresholds. We have the thresholds 5.0, 5.5, and 6.0. And to each of uh, the diagnostic thresholds correspond a single contingency table, where we have the numbers of true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. Um, to create a, a full RC curves, uh, curve, I have artificially um, added two thresholds, the, the trivial threshold of zero, where we have a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of zero, and the threshold of infinity, where we have a sensitivity of zero and a specificity of 100%. This is our situation. And we transferred the information from the contingency tables to the context of survival analysis. And we constructed um, something like a life table estimator shown here. Um, our um, um, time variable, so to speak, in, in context of survival analysis would be the values of our diagnostic tests. So the values of HbA1c, minimum zero. Here we have a maximum of six. And then on the y-axis, we have our event probability, which is in our case, the sensitivity. And then we transferred our uh, information from the contingency table to get this live table estimator depicted here as a black line. Um, so what happened? We have our first um, diagnostic threshold, 5.0. And in the contingency table, it's reported that we have 63 false negative results. So for 63 study participants, the HbA1c test was negative, but the persons were um, diseased. So they were tested false negative. And that means we have um, 63 study participants that were classified false negative. And if we increase the threshold, so if we change it from 5.0 to 5.5, there, there are are still false negative. So they had never the chance to be um, classified as, as true positive because they have a diagnostic test value of, for example, 4.8. 4.8 is below 5.0. So they are classified as false negative, but 4.8 is also below 5.5. And so um, even if we increase the diagnostic thresholds, there are still um, false negative. And this is... Um, why we defined being test negative in case of sensitivity is our event. And then we lose um, 63 persons at our first threshold and 267 um, persons at our um, threshold of 5.5. And this leads to the, the point estimates of sensitivity and uh, at this two diagnostic thresholds. So the simple idea is that we define the HbA1c test value is our time variable, sensitivity as event probability, and being test negative as the event of interest. And then we are in context of survival analysis. The same can be done for specificity. Then we have being test positive as our events of interest and calculate the, the, the specificity. 
this was our first um, idea, our first insight when looking at the data available at more detail. The second thing we observed is we do not have the individual test values of each study participants. That means we know that 63 participants are classified as false negative, um, but we only know that they have values below 5.0, uh, but, but we do not know what are these values exactly. So we do not know if someone has a value of 4.8 or 4.9 or 4.7, we only know a value below 5.0. And that means um, we are in case of so-called interwar sensor data. We know the, the exact value lies between 0 and 5.0, but we do not know the exact value. And um, this is called interwar sensor data. And if we aim for um, an appropriate statistical approach, we um, use methods from survival analysis that can account for interwar sensor data. And this is the whole idea be behind the model. And then we have some, some statistical uh, parts. We um, um, often use frequentist approach. So we, we make some distribution assumptions and we assume that our diagnostic test values, our HbA1c values are viable, log normal or log logistic distributed. Then we model the log transformed diagnostic test values in the population of diseased and non-diseased simultaneously and connect them by a random effect to account um, for the fact that there might be some correlations between them. So the final log model look this way. We have a random um, effects model in context of survival analysis, and we use the log transformation of our outcome to embed our model in the class of accelerated failure time um, models that can be, be easy estimated using standard software. So this is the, the, the only rational behind the log transformation. It embeds us to our to a class of models that, that can be easily fitted in a standard software. And we connect both uh, model equations for the disease and non-disease by a bivariate random effect. Um, in total, we have to estimate seven parameters, which is not that much, but we are not directly interested in the exact parameter estimates of the distributions. We are interested in the summary RC curve, so in the meta-analytic RC curve. And therefore, we predict sensitivity and specificity at various thresholds based on the best linear unbiased prediction principle. So we estimate our distributions, then we, we use the corresponding survival functions and predict um, the survival probabilities, which are in our case sensitivity and specificity at various thresholds. And then we get a full RC curve, a full meta analytic RC curve. Um, to, to, to imagine what this, what this means in practice, um, I've brought an example from diabetes research. Again, we have a systematic review based on the population-based screening for type 2 diabetes. This systematic review includes 38 studies that evaluate HbA1c as a diagnostic marker. And we have in total 124 pairs of sensitivity and specificity at 26 different thresholds. Um, an analysis with only the original reported 38 pairs, so one pair of sensitivity and specificity per study, would discard around about 70% of the available observations. So we, we would um, lose um, about 70% of all informations um, available in the studies, which should be avoided in practice. If we now use our approach um, based on viable log normal and log logistic distribution, we get um, the RC curves shown here. The, the gray uh, lines in the background are the RC curves from the original studies and our black, red and blue lines are the results from our model. And we see um, it worked quite well in practice. So um, it can be seen as something like, like an average of the RC curves from the original studies. And um, the advantage of the approach is that we use all available information. And, from, and now it's possible to determine sensitivity and specificity at specific thresholds. So a clinical corporation partner can come to me and say, 
Um, I'm interested in the meta-analytic sensitivity of HbA1c at a threshold of 6.5. I can insert it in our approach, and then I can tell the clinical cooperation partner um, what is the estimate of sensitivity at this specific threshold. Um, the output would be a sensitivity or specificity with a corresponding confidence interval, and we are also able to calculate the area under the curve. So we can calculate the area um, under the ROC curve as another measure for diagnostic test accuracy, and we can, can determine specific um, or can evaluate specific thresholds and also determine optimal ones. So um, the applicability has also been proven in, in extensive simulation studies, and we can show our model worked really well in practice. Um, this can also be extended in various ways. So one, um, one critic was, was already that we have a frequentist approach, so we make some assumptions. We have the viable distribution and so on. And... Um, the distribution assumptions can, it's difficult to check what is the, the most appropriate distribution that should be used. And so we developed um, a model that um, is able to cope with some more flexible distributions, which is the class of generalized F distributions. Um, and the viable log normal and log logistic distribution is, is, is also a member of this family of distributions. Um, so we can um, make model comparisons using the AIC or BIC, and we can also apply the generalized F distribution with has four parameters and then is therefore more flexible compared to the viable or log normal distribution, for example. Another way would be to, to use a semi-parametric approach, um, which comes along with um, fewer assumptions regarding um, the distributions which leads to a so-called piecewise constant approach, or, um, and this is what we are currently working on, we can also apply, apply our copula concept to estimate full RC curves. Um, finally, in the last, I would say, five minutes, I will give you a, just a short outlook what can be done in practice, um, and I will just um, show you, just shortly show you what is behind our semi-parentic approach, what is a piecewise constant model. And the, the idea is that um, we can use the piecewise constant approach to avoid an explicit specification of the distribution of the diagnostic test values. And you can see what is, what is meant by this. Um, we are on the hazard scale. We have here in blue depicted the hazard of a viable uh, distribution. And as a black step function, you can see what can be done using um, a hazard function that is constant in predefined intervals. So the, the step functions function should be used to approximate the blue viable hazard function. Um, I think this look, looks not that nice if we only look at the hazard function, but if we transform it on the survival scale, you can see what's happened. We have in blue our viable survival function and in black the survival function from the piecewise constant approach. And um, you can approximate nearly every survival function, nearly every parametric survival function using a piecewise constant approach, depending on how many pieces you define. So if you define many pieces, you get uh, rather close to the true viable survival function. This is what we have used in extending our model. We divide our diagnostic test values into different intervals defined by the thresholds and assume that the baseline hazard in the population of non-disease is constant in each interval. Um, so we modeled the piecewise constant baseline hazard function and then we move forward uh, to apply a univariate approach based on a pro proportional hazard assumption to keep the number of parameters that have to be estimated as small as possible. Um, we then include a binary covariate indicating whether someone um, um, is part of the diseased or non-diseased group. And then we arrive at our final model, which looks like um, a proportional hazard approach, but we have um, our baseline hazard function defined by a piecewise constant approach. Um, the number of parameters to be estimated depends then on the numbers of selected pieces. 
And our idea was that we use the different thresholds given in the meta analysis as pieces. And then we, est we finally estimate the sensitivity and specificity at these thresholds or at these pieces. And this leads for the same example as presented before for our HbA1c uh, HBA type 2 diabetes screening example to the results shown here. Um, the red line is our new model, our piecewise constant approach, and as gray lines, I already included the results from the um, time to event model from the parametric time to event model, and it can be seen that the piecewise constant approach also worked very fine, also confirmed by simulation studies. So we have um, an alternative that use slightly um, less assumptions, um, especially parametric assumptions, distribution assumptions. assumptions. Um, and then I, I would move to, to another special topic. Um, I would just say a few words with respect to reproducibility. So in practice, it is often the case that not only one group is developing several new approaches for, for meta analysis, for example, but there are several groups. And this is also the case when we're talking about the meta analysis of our C curves. And um, we've written a paper with other um, researchers that developed such methods with a group of Antonia Zapf and Cornelia Frimke. Um, who developed um, an approach, a non-parametric approach, and um, with a group of Gerta Rücker from Freiburg, um, where um, also a parametric approach was developed, and with Haley Jones from the UK, um, and she uses a, a Bayesian approach. And the idea was that we, we want to, to make a fair comparison of our different approaches, and therefore we um, made something called a data set challenge. We get a data set from nephrology um, with the aim to evaluate the diagnostic accuracy of neutrophil gelatinase lipokalin or NGAL uh, as a test for acute kidney injury. Um, we have a systematic review with 58 studies and the sensitivity and specificity are provided at three, uh, three different uh, thresholds such that the estimated sensitivity is at least 95%, the estimated specificity is at least 95%, and the estimated sum of sensitivity and specificity is maximized. This data were provided to us, and then um, everybody uh, used um, his or her developed method for the meta-analysis and to perform, to, to finally estimate the summary RC curves. So we compared in the, our, our paper um, four methods, the random effects model by Steinhauser et al., the, the Freiburg group, so to speak, the Bayesian approach by Jones et al., um, the time to event model presented by me in the talk today, and the non-parametric model by Frümke et al. And this is the result. So we have um, a, we had a, a data set available that no one of us um, was aware before. We simply applied our different approaches to and, and aim to compare them. And we, we have seen that the Scheinhauser model and um, my approach uh, lead to nearly the same results. And the Bayesian approach, the green line here on this graphic, um, leads to a bit higher um, estimates. And the non-parametric approach, the blue line here, leads to somewhat um, 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 uh, lower estimates. And the, the main results from this article were that we have different approaches working on, on different statistical assumptions. We have mm, comparable results, um, which are um, between the, the corresponding 95% confidence interval depicted here as gray lines. But um, for this example, we do not know the truth. So we have seen all methods are applicable, but we do not know which is the best approach. And therefore we are planning um, currently to perform a simulation study to, to extend our fair comparison and to show which model should be used in which situation. Furthermore, we can um, extend the approach to the to network meter analysis. So I aim for, for models that can be used to compare at least two diagnostic tests that provide our C curves, and then we, we want to have network meta analysis of, of our C curves. 
which is already applied in, in diabetic research. And then this is the last thing I would like to present to you. Um, we would also like to, to link our results to um, another research project uh, of my group where we used the Innes death model and to, to describe um, surveillance of, of chronic conditions. Here we have an extended Innes death model where somebody can be non-diseased, undiagnosed, diagnosed or that. Then we have our transition probabilities or transition rates between the states. And I would be interested what happened if we have a screening test available, what happened with the different transition rates. So if we have a screening test available, then um, we aim to, to remove persons who are undiagnosed, uh, undiagnosed faster to the state of diagnosed. And I would be interested how affect um, a valuable screening test, the mortality of undiagnosed. And this would be a future um, research project where we aim to link meta-analysis and the extended in this death model, model um, where we get the most appropriate diagnostic test from our meta-analysis and are interested in the impact on mortality from the undiagnosed state. And finally, to summarize what I've said before, um, the meta-analysis of RSC curves and already the, the meta-analysis of diagnostic tests require some advanced statistical techniques and are statistically challenging. But standard um, approaches neglect the majority of observations, so we are in need for new methods, and I pre have presented you some approaches that are motivated from survival analysis that show plausible and reliable results in practical applications. And the last thing before I would like to thank you, I would like to point out that there will be in the near future, hopefully, an official version, an official update of the Cochrane Handbook for the meta-analysis of diagnostic test accuracy studies where there will be um, a specific subchapter concerning the meta-analysis of our curves, where at least the Rücker-Steinhauser model um, will be recommended in future to perform this kind of meta-analysis. And with that, I would like to finish. Um, I thank you for listening, and I'm um, open for discussion and questions. Thank you.